We are going through the book of Isaiah, and we are up to chapter 58, where uh, we will uh, look at this morning. I think this morning I'll begin uh, by reading the first uh, five verses, and then we will uh, we'll start our message there. So let's uh, read God's holy uh, word. Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of God. They ask for me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to me. Why have we fasted and you, and you see, see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves? You take no, not, no knowledge of it. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Let's pray. Father, open up this, your word, to our hearts that we would see it clearly and that we would respond in faith and in obedience. In Jesus' name, amen. We saw last week that God is near to the humble and contrite of heart. Verse 15 of chapter 57 says, um, I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And so you think to yourself, all right, what can be more lowly and humbling than entering into a fast? You know, not taking any food or nutrition for a period of time, maybe for a day, maybe a little bit longer, maybe a little bit less. Denying yourself something, that'll certainly humble you. I don't know what you're like when you don't eat for a day, but some people are very humbled when they don't eat for 24 hours. So what can be more humbling than this? What can be more excellent than this? You think, surely, if, if God wants me to be humble and contrite, this would be surely be a way of doing it. And yet, fasting is really condemned, at least that particular kind of fasting is being condemned by our Lord in the first couple verses of this chapter. Fasting was a part of Old Testament life. We see numerous examples of it in the Old Testament. People uh, who uh, would, uh, oftentimes there were be a national fast would be declared for the nation to repent of a particular sin, or maybe there was some crisis that the nation was going through, a, an encroaching army was about to attack, or there's some natural disaster that the people are, uh, are, are dealing with, or there's drought, or there's even annihilation uh, in the book of Esther. There's a fast that's called amongst the Jews when it's realized that the people of Babylon are going to be given authority to wipe them out, to kill them. And so a fast is declared, and they seek the Lord, and they ask for his guidance and his protection. And that's often what you see in the Old Testament about fasting. Interestingly enough, as much as you see fasting in the Old Testament, there are very, very few commands that demand it. There is the command uh, about the Day of Atonement in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 29 says, uh, it shall be a statute to you forever that in the seventh month on the 10th day of the month you shall afflict yourselves and shall do no work uh, either the native or stranger who sojourns among you. Now that language, the way it's translated in the ESV, it, afflict yourselves, it has a broad meaning, but wherever we see that word in the rest of the Old Testament, it sort of implies that amongst that in affliction is fasting, people depriving themselves of something for a period of time um, so that they will consciously be aware of what's going on and so that God himself will be aware of what's going on. Uh, so that's the Day of Atonement, and that is really one of the few times where we see fasting even commanded, and even then it doesn't c 
come right out and say the word, but it, it's implied in the context that the children of Israel fasted before they celebrated the Day of Atonement. So why then do we get to Isaiah chapter 58? Why does God condemn their fasting? In fact, he calls it sin. He calls it sinful. Cry aloud, verse 1. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Interestingly enough, the, the trumpet uh, or the shofar, the, you know, the instrument that the horn that they would blow was, was often used to declare a fast or to declare a feast. So lift up the trumpet and to declare my people their transgression. The house of Jacob, their sins. And then he goes on to say how they are fasting and they're pretending to seek the Lord, but they're not really seeking the Lord. What's he doing here? Well, he's condemning what we would call ritualistic fasting. One of the things that happened as fasting became in vogue in the Old Testament, it began to take on a ritual of itself and people went through the mechanics of fasting without ever really addressing the heart issues that fasting was supposed to address. And that ultimately then is what God is condemning here in these first five verses. And you know that he's condemning their sin because it says in verse two, they act as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. In other words, they, they have acted unrighteously and they have forsaken the judgment of their God. Therefore, their fasting is not acceptable to me. Doesn't say it that way, but that's what he's implying there. Verses three to four describe then the sins and what makes this fasting uh, uh, unacceptable. And it's done in a question and answer form. In verse three, the people are asking the question, why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Now, why did they say God has not seen their fasting or take knowledge of it? Well, the, to me, the implication here is the people have fasted and prayed because prayer is often linked with fasting. But when they prayed, God didn't answer their prayer. And so they know, all right, God, you didn't answer our prayer. You must not have seen our fasting. Don't you see how humble we are? Don't you see how contrite we are? And that God answers the question in the second half of verse three, behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure. That's the first critique he has. That's the first thing they're doing wrong. They're seeking their own pleasures. In other words, your fasting is about what you want and not about what God wants. It's not about forgiveness, but it's about getting your own way. It's a way of saying, if I do this, then God, you have to do this, right? And that's their attitude. So they're fasting because, oh, if we fast, God will hear our prayer and God will give us what we want. And so they're trying to pull the strings and manipulate God as if the God of the universe could be a person that you can manipulate and get to do what you want to do. In verse three, there, or the end, um, you, well, the end of verse three, the first thing they do is that they uh, seek their own pleasure their, or their own will. And then the second thing they do is they oppress their workers. That's the very last line in verse three. Uh, you seek your own pleasure and oppress uh, your workers. In other words, you want God to help you and deal with your oppression, deal with the struggles that you have. But the very time you're asking God to help you, you're, you're not helping those people that are working for you and you're oppressing those people that are under you, and you're not caring for their needs, and yet you want God to care for your needs, so there's an incongruity here. The word for workers here is actually toilsome, or the, uh, or, or the workers that would, earn, that would work up a sweat. In other words, the kind of work and oppression that's going on here is hard, difficult, laborious labor. You know, think about some of the more difficult jobs that people do that require them to get you know, dirty and grungy and inhale all kinds of toxic chemicals and fumes because it's just the nature of the job. And it's those kinds of work that they're forcing these people to do and yet they're not caring about their well-being or about helping them in any way. They simply want God to help them. 
So uh, they're seeking their own pleasure, they're oppressing their workers, and the third thing they're doing is they quarrel and fight. That's the verse four, behold you fast only to quarrel and fight and to hit with a wicked fist. In other words, instead of their fasting leading to humility, their fasting led to pride and to arrogance. Now, some people, when they don't eat for a day, they get pretty irritable. And unrighteous people, when they are irritable, tend to react in violent, sort of offensive ways. And so that's what was happening. Because their fasting wasn't true fasting, it was self-serving in its purpose, and as a result, the end of the fast, they would just simply be hungry and be angry at everybody. In other words, what God is saying to them, and this is what verse five is about, is they're going through the physical gyrations of fasting, they're depriving themselves of food, but they're not really fasting. Their heart is really not in the right place with all of that. Is such the fast that I choose a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth on him uh, and ashes? And that, I mean, he's basically saying, look, you're going through the motions, but that's all you're doing. Is that what I want, God's saying? Do I just want people to go through the motions? There is a danger, I, I call it, uh, um, I call it uh, checkbox religion. And it's the kind of religion that says, uh, you know, you, you list a bunch of things on this side over here and you say, you know what, if I check off all of these boxes, if I, go to church and if I read the Bible and if I pray once in a while and I do this and I do all these religious things at the end of the day then God has to listen to me and God has to pay attention to what I'm doing and God has to be you, you know he has to do what I want him to do it's, it's checkbox religion it's thinking that somehow all the things that I do add up to me being righteous before God have an example of it in the New Testament in Luke chapter 18 where Jesus tells the parable of, a, of two men who went to the temple to pray. Verse, uh, Luke 18 uh, verse 9, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. And in verse 10, here's the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Tax collectors would have been the worst of sinners. They were the really, really, really bad people. And that Pharisees would have been the really, really righteous people who did all the right things. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extorterers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. Well, there it is. I give tithes of all that I get. You see the Pharisee, what he says, I don't do this, I don't extort, I don't do unjust gain, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not even a tax collector, I'm not in with the government and all their evil and all their wickedness. And instead, what I do, I fast and I give all that I get, I give tithes to the temple, I do everything I'm supposed to do. See God, what a righteous person I am. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Do you think you can exalt yourself before an almighty God? Do you think God deserves to, you deserve something from God because you've checked all the boxes of religiosity? Well, according to Jesus in Luke 18 and according to Isaiah and Isaiah 58, it doesn't work that way. Instead, what kind of fasting does God require? And that's really what the rest of the chapter is about. We'll read down to verse 12 from verse six to verse 12. Is not this the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not hide, to hide yourself from your own flesh? 
Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer, and you shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the, of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the new day. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall rise, raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. You see, true fasting here in verses 6 to 12, true fasting is denying yourself actually for the sake of others. See, you've been denying yourself for your own sake. But if you would deny yourself for the sake of others, that's real fasting. And he gives some examples in verses 6 and 7. In verses 6, he says to loose the bonds of wickedness. And then there's going to be a parallelism that, that he's going to repeat himself. But he's just going to say it in different ways. He, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. See how there's four things in there? And they mean basically the same thing. To loose the bonds of wickedness is to address, it appears to me, to address the social or the injustice and oppression in our world. Societal in, injustice. You know, things like unjust courts or unjust laws or unjust politicians who define justice, by the way, in their own terms and not the terms that God defines them in. All of those things are unjust and they tend to oppress people. They tend to bring people down. When you treat one group of people this way, but you treat another group of people completely different, that is unjust. Um, when you and that is oppressive to people, and it is it 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 is difficult for them and entraps them. It it, it causes them uh, to not have freedom and to not be able to live their lives in a way that would uh, that would bring honor and glory to God. It is difficult to live, and God says, "Look, I'm looking at your society and I'm looking at your world, and it's not a good place because." Because there, there are wicked things being done to people. There are burdens being put on them that should not be put on them. They are oppressed and they, instead they need freedom and they need liberty. Now verse, if verse 6 addresses the social context of injustice, verse 7 would address the personal implications of that. Uh, for example, in verse 7, well, it says, Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and to not uh, hide yourself from your own flesh? Hiding yourself from your own flesh means, you, you know, you have that brother-in-law that is in need and he's always after you to help him. <laughs> and you, every time he calls you, you, you know, you, you don't take the call or you run the opposite direction every time you see him. You know, you have a family member in need is what it's saying and yet you don't care for them and they, you don't care to make their needs. Um, this has to do with uh, injustice in personal terms, to care for the needy, to share bread, to help the homeless, to clothe the naked personal injustice and oppression, um, the, the poor, the sick, the addicted. By the way, there's all kinds of people, there's all kinds of oppression in our society. There's all kinds of pe people, um, there's all kinds of people who are under the burden of difficult kinds of, of oppression. Some people don't, are oppressed because they don't have the means they need to buy adequate nutritional food for themselves or to provide proper clothing for themselves or housing for themselves. Other people are oppressed by personal struggles with addictions. You know, it's easy to con condemn somebody that's addicted to something, but if you actually sat down with that person and learned their story and learned how the addiction came upon them and learned how difficult it is for them to break the addiction, you would, you would be amazed 
at how painful their life has been. And you would think, wow, God was gracious to me that that didn't happen to me because it could have very easily have happened to me. During the uh, COVID pandemic, a lot of the uh, AA groups that met in our area had to stop meeting because churches would not no longer allow them in their buildings. The, the, typically, that's where a lot of the buildings were met. I and mean, everybody was afraid about passing COVID on to somebody, you know, and all the fear and paranoia. So a lot of meetings where people went to for help to struggle with addictions all of a sudden stopped. And guess what happened? A lot of people fell back into their own habits. Do you care about things like that? Do we as a church care about things like that? Fortunately, we kept our we were able to keep the building open all the time and 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 AA and people were able to use it. But this is the kinds of things there's all kinds of ways that people are oppressed. And and God is saying through the prophet Isaiah you're fasting, you're denying yourself because you want me to do something for you, but what about all these people in the world that are struggling? Do you want me to do anything for them? And in some respects, in order for God to answer our prayer, Lord, make my life better, Lord, <laughs> help me not to suffer, in some ways, for God to answer that prayer for me, he also has to answer that prayer for the rest of the world who are struggling and suffering with similar kinds of things. So true spiritual fasting is not so much about caring about my needs, but caring about the needs of others. And do I care for them? That's the question. Now, here's what God promises. When you begin to participate in true fasting, when you really begin to care about not just your needs, but the needs of everyone else around you, here's what happened. There's a whole list of things that he, that he lists in verses 8 to 12. There's going to be a new day or a new life. Look at verse 8. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn. There's going to be a new beginning when you start to fast this way. There's going to be a new life that's going to break forth. Secondly, there's going to be personal restoration. And your healing shall spring up speedily. There's the healing. What kind of healing do people need? Well, people need physical healing for sure. But there's also emotional healing that we need. There's also spiritual healing that we need. There's psychological healing. There's, all, there's relational healing, healing between family members and between neighbors. There's all kinds of healing that our world needs. And God says, look, when you begin to be concerned about the things that I'm concerned with, my healing will come. There's going to be security. In the, in the end of verse 8, your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. So wherever you go, God is saying, I will go before you, and I will go behind you. I will protect you from behind, and I will lead you from the front. That's security. When God is in front of you, and God is behind you, it really doesn't matter what else is going on in the world. That's true security, and God says that will happen when you begin to be concerned about the things that concerns me. And then verses six to seven in our text end up repeating, or I'm sorry, verses um, nine to 10, parts of those begin to repeat a lot of what he just said in verses uh, six and seven. Um, verses nine, uh, then if you, uh, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light shine in darkness and your gloom be in new day. That's the fourth thing that God promises is that your light will shine in darkness and your gloom uh, and your gloom be as noon day. Now what's he talking about that? I think he's talking about having a clarity, having a knowledge of truth light will rise in the darkness you will know what the truth is you will know the way you ought to go like the, the purpose of light is so that we can see what's at really there and so god says i will show you the truth when you begin to be concerned about the things that concern me fifthly you see the promise of satisfaction in verse 11 verse 11a and the lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places. 
hard to satisfy your desire in scorched places. It's hard to be satisfied in the desert when there's no water, there's, no, uh, there's only heat, and there's only dry air. But here's what God says, even in the most difficult circumstances, I will satisfy you when you concern yourself with the things that I'm concerned with. Sixthly, we're promised fresh vitality in the last half of verse 7, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. It's a new vitality. It's a new freshness. And seventh, we're promised restoration in verse 12. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, and you shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the re breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Now, verse 12, to me, looks like not just a personal restoration, but a whole societal <laughs> restoration. Because what happens if God's people then begin to be more concerned with the needs of others than they are concerned about their own needs? What happens to society as a whole? Society as a whole becomes a better place. And the whole world is restored. You shall be called the repairer of the breach. In other words, you're going to be the ones, you're going to be the people that will restore the streets and that will bring about this peace this restoration, you're gonna be known for, and it's not just for your generation, but for generations to come. So the promise is this, the blessing of true fasting is this, a new day, a personal restoration, security, clarity, satisfaction, fresh vitality, restoration. In other words, <laughs> Everything that they were praying for in the beginning of the chapter, God is now going to answer at the end of the chapter. Why? Because now they are concerned with the things that concern God. They are concerned with the weak and the poor, with the ailing. They are concerned with the naked. They are concerned with injustice. They are concerned with the oppressed. They care about the very people that God cares about. What did we read about in the beginning? Remember that, that verse that I read in the beginning of the service today? The God who raises the poor from the dust, lifts the needy from the ash heap, and makes them to sit with princes. He, he turns the most humble people into princes and rulers and kings. And he gives barren woman a home. You, you think of the most humiliating thing to be a woman and to be married in this culture and to not have children. And yet what does God do? He takes the humble woman who has no ch children and all of a sudden he gives her children. He takes the needy and the poor and the broken and he raises them up. That's the God of the Bible. And if we don't act like that's the God of the Bible, if we think God is just concerned about us and our needs, then we've missed the whole point of it. What did Jesus say? You remember when Jesus began his ministry, he stood up in Luke chapter 4. He's in the, uh, he's not in the, in the temple. He's, um, he's, in the, he's, in the, his, he's in the Sabbath worship service there. And he reads, he stands up and he reads the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he reads from Isaiah 61, which we're going to look at in a couple of weeks. And he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he begins to go out from the synagogue meeting. He begins to go out and live that way. He begins to proclaim to the poor and the oppressed the good news of the gospel. He heals their diseases. He, he performs miracles. He, he, he overcomes their suffering. And more than that, he deals with their sin and rebellion. He deals with it by dying on a cross. Because ultimately, poverty and oppression and injustice is simply the result of sin. And Jesus ultimately comes to deal with sin by dying on a cross and atoning for sin and rising from the dead. If there's any doubt what God's, where God's heart is, uh, you can only, all you have to do is read Isaiah and then look at Jesus. Now our chapter ends all of a sudden with seemingly with a different theme here. 
It says in verse 13, if you turn your back, if you turn back your foot from the chapter, or, or you turn back your foot from the Sabbath and from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own way or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. Notice this, that the first half of Isaiah, of Isaiah 58 talked about a fasting without a blessing. But the last two verses of Isaiah 58 talk about a feasting with a blessing. The Sabbath day was a day of fasting. In one sense, you stopped work in the Old Testament Sabbath, but you stopped work for the purpose of celebrating God's goodness. And so you replaced work with fun things. You replaced them with meeting with family or with eating or with rejoicing or with singing, with all kinds of, you replace work with these other things. The Sabbath properly practiced in the Old Testament was more like a holiday in our time, you know, a time where you get together with friends or family or a time where you would just rejoice. And we celebrate this Sabbath. Every time we gather on Sunday morning to worship, we gather as friends to celebrate God's goodness, to rejoice in him. Sometimes we eat a meal after the service. Sometimes we eat a meal in the middle of the service when we do the Lord's Supper. We celebrate all that God has done for us. But in order to do that, we have to put aside our normal, ordinary things of life. We have to not be going to work. We have to not be doing these other things. So we put those, we fast on those things to set aside so that we can celebrate God's goodness. And that Sabbath celebration is where everything is heading in the eschatological sense, in the last day sense. Everything is heading towards a celebration. Do you realize heaven is described as a banquet feast? The marriage, the wedding feast between the, lamb, the bride and the lamb. And it's a great banquet. It is a time of great feasting, and it is a time of celebration. Why? Because when that day comes, there will no longer be the poor. There will no longer be injustice. There will no longer be oppression. There will no longer be unrighteousness on the earth. And instead, there will just be joy and celebration for what God has done. And so in a sense, what Isaiah is saying is that fasting done right anticipates the ultimate feasting that will come at the end of the age. Because fasting done right cares more about the needs of others than it cares about our own needs. It cares about eliminating injustice. It cares about eliminating oppression. It cares about the needy. It cares about the weak and the vulnerable. And so Isaiah ends with this glorious celebration, celebrating the Sabbath, rejoicing in the fact that God has made this all possible. And because we know how the Bible ends, we know that the way God made this all possible was by the sending of his son into the world to atone for sin. And that his death and his resurrection makes it possible for the ultimate enemy of sin, the thing that ultimately brings poverty and injustice to our world, to do away with it. So, what about you? Do you care about the things that God cares about? Is your heart inclined to him? Because that's what true fasting should do. It should turn our hearts to him. Let's pray that God does that work in us even this morning. Let's pray. Lord God, we need you to change our hearts. Because the truth is we are often selfish and self-consumed. We care more about our own needs than we care about the needs of others. But we thank you, Lord, that that is not your heart. And that is not where your passions lie. We thank you that you care for the weak and the vulnerable. We thank you that you care for the unrighteous. You care for the sinners who don't know how to get out of the mess that they're in. You care for those people. And you have designed a way to rescue those people. Lord, help us know, even this morning, 
the joy of putting our faith and trust in this Jesus. And as we celebrate this table this morning, may we be reminded of your goodness to us in Christ our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen.